The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This is Your FBI. <laughs> This is your FBI, an official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. Before enacting tonight's timely case, I'd like to call your attention to a very significant fact about the sponsor of tonight's program, the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. And that's the increasing number of women who are becoming members of the Equitable Society. More and more, women are seeking security through life insurance. They call on Equitable Society representatives eager to know of the many uses and applications of modern life insurance. In fact, a number of our Equitable Society representatives are themselves women. I'll tell you about one of them later. Just like the men, they realize the value of life insurance both to the individual policyholder and to the community. They know that by serving Equitable Society members, they serve America. Tonight's FBI file, The Bogus War Bride. Tonight's case from the files of your FBI presents another in the series of demonstrations of gratitude for the heroic sacrifices of the returned veteran being performed daily by that lower rung member of America's criminal society. He who was first in lying, first in cheating, and first in the pockets of his countrymen, the swindler. <laughs> In a certain bar off Times Square, which became a favorite oasis of G.I.s during the war, two of the last three vacant stools have been quickly spotted by the deliriously happy couple just coming in the door. Well, here we are, baby. Bartender, give us a couple of champagne cocktails. Okay. We got a lot of celebrating to do tonight, huh, Betty? Rather. Oh, listen to that. Rather what? Rather be here than any sport on earth, that's what. <laughs> oh, you kill me with those quick comebacks, oh. baby. You know, that's what got me into this mess to start with. Now, just what do you mean by that, George? That night in Piccadilly when I asked you to marry me, you came back with yes so quick I didn't have a chance to change me blooming mind. Well, <laughs> if that's the way you feel about it, I'll get right back on the boat and go home. Would you really, baby? I say, what a jolly big lawyer I am, what? <laughs> Here's your drinks, mister. Oh, thanks. Here, baby. Go. Here's to the Queen Mary for bringing me Princess Betty. Here's to you, love. Congratulations, chum. Huh? Uh, congratulations. Oh, thanks, pal. My bride's still stuck over there. Uh -huh. May take another six months. Oh, sir, what a pity. Yeah, it's tough. Anyway, let me join in drinking to your reunion. Thanks, it's awfully nice of you. Yeah. Well, here's to you. Here's hoping you and your missus beat that six-month rap. Rather. You know, confidentially, pal, my wife here would still be stuck over there, too, if I hadn't run onto a way to do a little finagling. Joy. What's the matter? You want us to get arrested on our first night? What do you mean, get arrested? We're talking about how we worked it, that's why. Oh, look, baby, the soldier here is one of us. Well, you can't tell who else might be listening. Well, there's no police in here. Just because you don't see any brass buttons, there's no sign. Okay, okay. Look, I, I don't know how you worked it to get your wife over, but I'd sure like to know. Well... I guess you can tell from the way Betty's putting the clamps on me that it's kind of a down-under proposition, if you know what I mean. Anything that will get my wife over here is all right with me. After all, she's, she's got a right to be here, hasn't she? Come on. Let's all move over to that empty booth in the corner. Okay. Come on, baby. All right, oh. Excuse me, mister. Slide in, sugar. Charlie. Now, look, pal. Yeah? Maybe I better tell you first how much this deal cost me. How much? 500 smackers. 
five hundred. Can't you raise it? I guess I can. No, these guys work fast. Well, I'll have the dough tomorrow. That fast enough? Yeah, I guess so. Okay. What's the proposition? Is it all right with you if I tell him, Betty? After all, I gotta help a buddy, you know. Go ahead. Okay. If you can raise 500 bucks tomorrow, you can get your wife over here in two or three weeks, just like I did. Really? Sure. And here's how it works. In the local field office of the FBI, Assistant Agent in Charge Everett has just summoned Special Agent Grafton to his office. You sent for me, Mr. Everett? Yes, Grafton. I uh, just got a special teletype from Director Hoover. A swindle case he wants us to go to work on right away. Yes, sir. It's a fake passport racket being worked against returned veterans whose foreign brides are still over there. Oh? Due to the tremendous backlog of applications for passports and other necessary papers, it may be several months before some of the wives can get over here. I know. So the racketeer spots a veteran whose wife is way down the list and sells him a fake American passport to send to his wife. Mm-hmm. Have we got any lead? Two of these fake passports were picked up in London yesterday when two brides presented them for inspection. I see. They're being rushed to us by airmail. But in the meantime, here are the names and addresses of the two husbands here in the city. Aren't they liable to arrest on a conspiracy charge? Technically, yes. But Mr. Hoover has no desire to arrest a veteran for trying to get his wife over here. All we want is their cooperation in exposing the swindlers. Well, then I better try to contact them right away. One of them lives out in Jackson Heights. The other one up near Columbia University. Here are the addresses. Okay. And see if you can get a good description of who sold them the passports and how and where they were contacted. Right. You got that passport for the sucker nearly ready, baby? Just about, George, old thing. Oh, look, can that accent, will you, when we're not working on somebody? Okay, sugar. But if I slip out of character in the middle of a deal sometime... Well, it just might be rather embarrassing for us, don't you know? <laughs> you and your British understatement. Look, George, you better get some more of this kind of paper from the station or we're about out. Never mind. We'll get some more when we get to the West Coast. Yeah, but we only got enough left for... What did you say? I said we'll get some more paper on the West Coast. What do you mean, West Coast? That's where we're going. How come? Look, baby, we've been sprinkling these phony passports around here like confetti. And making lots of nice dough, too. I know. And the way to keep the dough is to change scenery before we get caught. What makes you think we're Think gonna... nothing. We're hotter than a couple of tamales right now. So? So, two more suckers after tonight, and we head for Frisco. Why Frisco? Because, my pet, there is a very sad situation out there, too. Huh? Yep. There's a lot of poor G.I.s out there with wives way out in Australia. Oh, of course, of course. And I must do something for me blooming sisters down under. What? Can I come in, Mr. Everett? Oh, come ahead, Grafton. Uh, did you locate the husbands? I talked to one of them. The other's out of town. What'd you find out? Well, I got a pretty good description of the swindlers. Good. How many are there? A man and a woman. Oh? Yes, he's around 35. She's younger and speaks with a British accent. Uh-huh. They uh, play the midtown bars frequented by servicemen and put on a big act about how happy they are to be reunited. She plays the part of his British bride who's just arrived. I see. And some serviceman whose wife is still overseas butts in and asks how they managed it. And there's another victim ready to be taken. Cost this chap $500. Well, obviously the swindler didn't produce a phony passport on the spot. At their first meeting, I mean. No, the victim raised the money and they met again next day to complete the deal. But he had no idea of where to contact the swindler in the meantime. That's right. First contact was at a bar and the second meeting took place at the victim's house. All right. Phone the descriptions of the swindlers to the police department and see if they check with anybody they have a record on. Right. And I'll get every available agent we have and get them started covering all midtown bars at once. <laughs> Hello? Hiya, pal. This is George. Oh, hello there. 
Everything set? I talked to the guys, and they didn't want to do business. What? They wanted to lay off for a while. Afraid they might be getting hot. Yeah, yeah, but look, I, I already raised the 500 bucks. They can't back out on me. I gotta get my wife over here. Okay, okay, you're gonna get her here. Yeah, but you just said... Keep your shirt on, will you? You're in. I don't get it. Look, I'm not letting a buddy down. I talked the guys into making a deal for you. Yeah? They're just scared to deliver any more in person, the new customers, you see? Oh. So I promised I'd deliver yours for them and collect the dough for them. Then you've got it. Sure. Have you got the 500 with you? Yeah. Where, where'll I meet you? At that same bar? No, no, we better make it somewhere more private. I don't want to get caught either, you know. I'd have a tough time proving I'm not mixed up in this business. Sure, I know. I'll meet you wherever you say. Okay, how about your place? Swell. 36 Cherry Lane, down the village, basement apartment. Okay. Be there in 20 minutes. Nobody like that in your files, huh, Sergeant? Okay, well, thanks a lot anyway. Police headquarters hasn't got anything on them, Grafton? No. Then I'll teletype the descriptions to Washington to see if identification has got anything that checks. Okay. You better hop out and cover a few midtown bars yourself for a while. Right. Uh, take the area between Broadway and 8th Avenue from 46 to 49th. I've got the rest covered. Want me to call in in case something breaks? Yeah. And I hope there's a break before another victim loses $500, too. Just a minute. Oh, hello, George. Come Hi. on in. Okay. Look, I, I can't stay long. Guys gave me an hour to get back with the dough, and besides, Betty don't know I'm doing this, or she'd be scared to death. I was afraid you might change your mind yourself on the way down here. Ah, you know, I never let a buddy down. I know. Okay. Where's the dough? Where's the passport? I got it right here. Well, let's see it. What's the matter? You think it's a gag? I just want to see what I'm getting for my money, didn't you? Yeah, yeah, sure. Well? Okay. There you are. Thanks. And I'm telling you, pal, it's a perfect imitation, too. Uh-huh. All the information you gave me and your wife is fixed up in there right. All you got to do is paste a picture on there and you're all set. Yeah. All set to get my wife and me in a jam, maybe, and lose 500 bucks besides. What? She'd have as much chance of getting through on this as she would on a hat check. What are you talking about? My wife came through on one and Cut I... Cut out the lion, mister. I got wise to your racket this morning. You rooked a pal of mine on the same deal. Look, buddy, you got me wrong. I'm not mixed up in any racket. I said cut out lion. But I'm telling you that... I went through with this just to get you down here, and the reason I haven't got a couple of cops waiting for you is because I wanted to do a little work on you myself first. Now, what do you mean? I mean, like... Uh, stand up, you dirty chiseler, and take another one. Stand up! Here we are, soldier. Put that gun away. Not when it's about to go off. Sucker. Some of the most important people in the American business world are women. While waiting for tonight's FBI file to reopen, let me tell you about one who works for our sponsor, the Equitable Life Assurance Society. This week at the Equitable Society, I met one of America's outstanding businesswomen. She's a leading life insurance saleswoman. I asked her just how she happened to be in the life insurance business. Well, she said, when my husband and I were just starting out in life, we had very little money, but we had great plans. And we had a brand new life insurance policy in the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. One month later, my husband died. Well, the money from his Equitable Society policy didn't lessen my grief and shock. But it did help me through some mighty difficult times. And one day I thought to myself, why, I can sell this. I can show people the importance of life insurance because I know from personal experience. So I got a position with the Equitable Society and now I spend my life in this satisfactory business of building security. 
Well, having talked with her, I understand why 30% of all equitable life assurance society policies are currently being bought by women. Professional women, business women, women whose career is a home. Women everywhere are seeking the protection and security that comes with a policy in the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Yes, women too know that this week and every week for more than 86 years, the Equitable Life Assurance Society has been building security for you, your home, and your country. And now back to the FBI file the bo bogus war bride. There is a principle of human justice embodied in the codes of law wherever human rights are respected. A principle often referred to as mitigating circumstances. In the Victor Hugo classic, Les Miserables, Jean Valjean was guilty of a robbery, but he stole in order to feed his starving family. That was the mitigating circumstance which lessened his guilt in the eyes of the just. Such a defense might be offered to lessen the guilt of the GI who was a victim of impersonation and conspired in the forgery of a passport. He was about to do it with the honorable intention of reuniting his family. In the office of the FBI, Assistant Agent in Charge Everett is just finishing a telephone conversation as Special Agent Grafton enters the office. Yes? Yes, all right, and thanks a lot, Inspector. We'll have an agent over there right away. Uh, Grafton? What's up? That was Inspector Riley of the Homicide Squad. Oh? An ex-serviceman was shot and seriously wounded a little while ago in his village apartment. I see. We don't know whether it has any connection with the shooting, but uh, a fake passport made out for his wife was found in the man's pocket. Uh-oh. The police are taking him now to St. Anthony's Hospital. By the time you get there, he may have regained consciousness. Well, I'm on my way. Uh, ask the police to let you have that fake passport. It might be our best lead to date in case the chap doesn't recover. And get back as soon as you can, will you? Right. Your stuff together quick, baby. We got a scram. Why? What's all the excitement? I had to let the sucker have it. You did what? Somebody put him wise. He was waiting for me with both fists. George, you mean you... You think I'm going to stand there and let him work on me? You stupid fool, you... Look, baby, don't stand here gabbing. I killed the guy. Don't you understand? Well, if you're sure you killed him, that's not so bad. What do you mean? Well, I'll have a tough time tying it in with you. George... You had sense enough to bring it back with you, didn't you? What? Don't tell me you left that fake passport down there. Yeah, yeah, I did. Oh, brother! Oh, stop your beeping, will you? We gotta get out of here. Not me. Huh? We're a lot better off staying right here. Why do you figure that? Well, if somebody put them wise to us, they can also put the cops wise to what we look like. Okay, but we... will be watching every train, bus, and airline for us. All right, you stay here, baby, but I'm getting out... Wait a minute! They catch you, I fall too. Yeah, but we... No dice, George. You're sticking right here with me. You understand? Okay. Now, sit down, genius. Give me the whole story. <laughs> Well, I talked to the victim, Mr. Everett. Good. What'd you get, Grafton? The swindler we've been looking for shot him. But he was apparently in such a hurry to get away, he left the fake passport behind. Was he able to give more than a description of the swindler? Only that he's known as George, and the girl is Betty, that's all. I see. The fingerprints of both of them are probably on this fake passport. We'll put it through for a check right away. And we ought to have another lead in the kind of paper they used in making them up. Right. 
Shall I take a sample of it and start checking stationers to see who handles it and who's been buying it? Yes, you start the ball rolling on that while I cover on all train, bus, and air terminals. Right. And then we'll... Hey, wait a minute. Yeah? Well, we'll watch the travel terminals anyway. They're probably taking the smarter course of staying under right here. In that case, it's up to us to smoke them out. And I think I've got an idea that'll do just that. George. Huh? Oh, I'm getting. There's not a thing in the morning paper about your little stunt last night. You ought to hire a press agent. Never mind the wisecracks, will you? Oh, for heaven's sake, relax. You've been jumping up and down like a sewing machine all morning. I've got a right to be jumpy, haven't I? You don't hear my knees knocking, do you? I don't like it. There not being anything in the paper about it. I told you to get a press agent. I don't mean that. Well, what do you mean? Look, sometimes cops keep things like this out of the paper on purpose. Like what purpose? Like when they suspect somebody of doing the job and don't want the papers to tell them so and make them harder to catch. Will you stop feeling the police breathing on your neck? Look, lay off, will you? I'm sick of... Wait a minute, wait a minute. What is it? Well, genius. You can relax. Why, what'd you find? The newspaper didn't ignore your little party last night after all. Well, what's it say? The sucker's not dead. What? Then what do you mean, relax? He's in the hospital. We'll recover, and all he will say for publication at this time is that the shooting was all a mistake. And he refuses to identify the person who did it. No kidding. Well, what do you know? I think you ought to send him some flowers, George. I think we ought to get out of here now. Let's head for the coast, like I said. Wait. What? How would you like for us to make maybe a lot of money all at once first? How do you mean? Selling another passport? Oh, are you crazy? We're both crazy if we don't make this sale. Who to? According to the paper here, the rich and social Richard Adams, ex-GI, is having all manner of trouble getting his blooming British broad over here, don't you know? Yeah? Yeah. And he's crying about it. From the plush depths of his penthouse apartment. And here's the address. Hey. I'll make up a book for him right away. You trade it to Mr. Adams for 5000 and we'll be off for Frisco. Well, here's the report on that fingerprint check, Mr. Everett. Identify them? Yes, sir. The man is George Canton, alias George Patterson. And the girl? His accomplice, Betty Douglas, former nightclub entertainer. Both have swindling records. Good enough. And we've located the stationer who sells the paper used in the fake passports. Oh? He identifies George Canton as one of his customers, but has no address for Canton. Well, we won't worry too much about that right now. I have a plan in mind that should solve all our worries. It's about time you showed. California, here we come. You did okay? Oh, that guy Adams was like shooting lions in the zoo, baby. How much? Five Gs, just like you said. Where is it? Right here. Give it to Mama. Huh? You heard me. I said give it to Mama. But, sweetheart, I can... First, I want to see if it's all here. What's the matter? Don't you think I can add? Yeah. I think you can subtract, too. Don't trust me, huh? The last guy I trusted was the last guy. Hey, well, what's the idea? Why haven't you got your stuff packed yet? Oh, only take a minute. I guess you didn't have much faith in my salesmanship, huh, baby? Not after your performance last night. All right, all right. Lay off that now, will you? It's all turned out sweet, hasn't it? Uh, I'm going to keep my fingers crossed anyway until we're on the... Uh-oh. Keep quiet. It's too late for that. Whoever it is must have heard us talking. Okay. You go to the door and throw it open. I'll be ready with a blast. You think... Go on, do what I tell you. Hello there. Well, Mr. Adams. That's right. And your butler, too. 
<laughs> What's the idea? If you'd brought the young lady with you, we wouldn't have had to follow you here. What do you mean? I mean, miss, that we're really special agents of the FBI. What? I'll take that gun. Oh, oh, George! 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 <laughs> Your victim down at the hospital is ready to <laughs> identify you for publication now. Come on. For forging and counterfeiting a government document, the passport swindlers are now serving full term in a federal penitentiary. After he has paid his debt to the United States government, the man called George must still stand trial on a charge of assault with intent to commit murder in New York State. And once again, your FBI joins with your local law enforcement officers in urging you, the potential victims of swindlers, to be wary of the stranger with a proposition. If the proposition is sound, it will keep long enough for you to investigate it and the person who offers it. If it is unsound, your investigation will prove it to be so. That is your duty to yourself and to society. Next week, another exciting adventure story from the files of your FBI. We'll tell you about it in just a moment. As you listen to tonight's radio program, you must have realized why you look to your FBI for national security. Trained men such as these FBI agents are the best safeguard you can have. And you can depend upon the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States for the financial security of life insurance for the same reasons. Able, trained men and women, experts in preserving homes, in keeping children in school, making old age comfortable. The Equitable Society representative in your community, the name Equitable Society is in your telephone book, is skilled in all phases of life insurance security and experienced in its application to your particular problems. He, yes, and she, specialize in building security for you, your home, and your country. Next week, we will bring you another colorful story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, The Delinquent Parents. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was under the direction of Frederick Steiner, the author was Frank Ferries, and your narrator was Dean Carlton. This is your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. This is Carl Frank speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community and inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States will bring you another colorful story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The Delinquent Parents. On this is your FBI. ABC, the American Broadcasting Company.